is the next at the University of Oregon. She has over 20 years of project management experience with a focus on land use, transportation, economic development, and strategic planning projects. In her current position, she manages and conducts technical research on the secondary impacts of emerging technologies. So please welcome, join me in welcoming Becky. So, and if there's 
If they can't achieve that safety, then there's really no reason to have them on, on our roads. And so, like I said, uh, I am studying not only autonomous vehicles, but also e-commerce and the sharing economy. And I'm not studying the technology itself, but really thinking, how is it going to change city form and city development? And so some things to think about, um, and definitely for the folks that I'm talking to and, and working with, uh, you know, we're uh, seeing kind of a difference in the way that we actually access and use transportation. So historically, um, we pretty much, you know, uh, had a model where we owned our own vehicles. I bet everyone in this room probably has one in their household. Um, and right now, we might still have that vehicle, but we're experimenting with all these different ways that you can access transportation. Um, whether it's through Zipcar or Biking Town is my hometown, uh, Bike Share, um, Lime, or Bird with e-scooters, uh, and of course Uber, Lyft, car to go those kinds of things. And it's, uh, you know, really a, um, you know, this potential change in a model of uh, accessing transportation where at some point we might actually stop purchasing vehicles or I might, and you might always have a car, but my kids, my daughter who's in third grade, might not ever get her driver's license. She might not ever purchase a vehicle. And instead, she might just purchase and rent that small bit of the transportation system that she needs at that time, at that price, at that convenience and cost that works for her. And I can't wait to get the ride on the rocket when it comes to And you don't have to just trust me, but you can also start to follow the money. Uh, companies like Ford um, are really investing in, uh, in the smart mobility. And so they have announced they're going to be investing about $4 billion, not just in autonomous vehicles, but also mobility as a service. And they really see the future as not just building cars, but then also providing the ride. And so not only are they you know, helping to develop um, autonomous vehicles, but they're also purchasing, they have a car share, or excuse me, a bike share company, and they've also purchased Chariot, which is a microtransit. So really thinking about moving around groups of people and offering that service. Um, I would say GM also um, announced about a $3 billion investment. And I think it was just last year, about a year ago, that 10 out of the top 11 um, major car manufacturers announced that they would have autonomous vehicles um, within the next four years. And so I think some will probably achieve that, others maybe not so much. Um, but it's definitely a change that the car companies are, are investing and they're betting on. And so, um, definitely thinking about uh, autonomous vehicles and, you know, I think you're going to see uh, vehicles that look very similar to uh, and familiar to what we have right now. But there's no reason they have to look exactly like that. And so we might see some real, um, uh, some of the prototypes actually are getting uh, pretty wild from, uh, I just saw something today where someone had proposed putting an office on wheels, or a hotel room on wheels, or a cafe on wheels that can get you where you need to go while you do something else. Um, definitely afraid to even talk a little bit more about this. The way we move goods is likely to change once it's automated and then transit. Um, and there's some things to think about and some real questions about how this is going to impact cities and communities. And one of those questions is, um, are these gonna be all individually owned, kind of like we do right now, or is it gonna be owned by fleets? And one of the arguments that I would make is that it's likely to be um, in fleets and that companies like Uber and Lyft um, are likely to have a, a fleet of autonomous vehicles and then offer the service with your, your phone where you just order that service. And so um, one of the things that's great for me, definitely as a researcher, is that uh, we can look at the, some of the impacts we see right now from uh, Uber and Lyft and kind of extrapolate, well, what happens when you actually automate that? We think of those companies as being autonomous vehicles but with drivers. Um, and there's some real differences that happen um, if everybody has their own autonomous vehicle, then I imagine a, a Monday morning where you know, I get my ride to work and then the vehicle comes back empty and it picks up my son and it takes him to his school and then it comes back and it gets my daughter and it takes her. And for each of those rides, there's an empty, there's an empty amount of time. And so, uh, and even with fleets, you've got those cars that are driving around and maybe um, are a little bit more efficient. Another thing to think about is, and it's you know, something that we, um, we see today, the difference between 
you know, are we going to be purchasing these rights um, just for ourselves alone so that we can, we can have some alone time? Um, and having kids, I really value that. Um, are we going to share our rights? Are we going to carpool? And there's some real differences between the amount of traffic and congestion um, between these two options. And really, if we continue with the single occupancy vehicles, then some of the preliminary modeling shows that the congestion that's on our roads go through the roof. Like they could be two or three times or even more than what we have today. And it's a lot of those, um, I'm already ruining my next slide, but because of some of those, um, at those empty miles. Uh, even if you have shared rides, there's been some uh, studies and modeling done by um, a consulting firm, and even under the best scenario where 75% of the rides are shared, um, uh, congestion still increases by about 40%. So, so let that kind of sink in a little. Um, and as I said, a lot of that is because of the potential for vehicles to be empty and be driving around without anybody in them. Um, and as we affectionately call our zombie cars. And as we're thinking about this too, um, it's important to think about the role of transit and the importance of transit. And so as I'm, as I'm talking about all this, definitely kind of keep that in mind, that one of the most efficient ways to move people around is by um, dedicated transit. And one of the important things to keep in mind as well is that um, hopefully our public transit agencies are thinking about how do you move everybody, no matter how much money they have or what parts of town they're in. You know, there's, there's equity related concerns if we end up, um, uh, you know, giving over the ability for people to move around to private companies and are they going to keep the, um, are they really going to make sure that uh, all people can, can get a ride and even those companies today um, have a hard time moving families that might need a car seat or if you have um, a wheelchair or other, you know, uh, um, you need additional help getting kind of in and out of vehicles. Um, there's some real concerns that those companies will be able to provide that use. Um, and I just want to emphasize this too because, again, some of the preliminary modeling of what this could look like and how many people might move to autonomous vehicles is showing that um, transportation use could decrease by up to 40%. And I don't know an, an agency, as soon as it starts to go in the single digits, they're starting to cut service, and it has real financial implications. And so I don't know what transit agency survives if 40% of their service goes away. So it has some real kind of implications of, you know, what do we want to do about this? Uh, so, so far I've really talked about mobility as a service and how people move around. And so I want to I kind of switch gears here a little bit and think a little bit more about how goods move. Um, how many of you are Amazon Prime members? Can you hear it? What did you say? Oh, how many people are Amazon Prime members or ordered something online? All right, I've done that recently too. Um, and uh, so we've probably seen, um, you know, a, a lot more delivery trucks in our neighborhoods, and uh, I actually saw. A, technology in the wilds. About a year ago, I was in Washington, D.C., and I saw this little delivery drone uh, going down the sidewalk. And it's, it's one of those things you see and you know, oh, this is going in a presentation, so I'm getting my phone, and I'm like, you know, taking a picture, and there's a gentleman that's walking behind it. And um, so I asked him, you know, you know, it's okay if I take a picture, and, and what are you doing? And he's like, well, we're testing, you know, in Washington, D.C., uh, these drones have to have a handler that we're not touching, I'm not doing anything, um, and we're making a Chipotle delivery. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, the new uh, burrito delivery service uh, coming to a place near you. Um, you know, when I bring this up, I'm probably going to replace this picture in future slides. Uh, uh, Kroger's, which is one of the largest grocery store chains in the, in the uh, country, uh, right now is uh, just starting an uh, autonomous service, um, and it's, it's something kind of similar to that, but a larger and refrigerated um, kind of version, smaller than a car um, vehicle that would then deliver groceries. And so they're starting to do tests and pilots of that. So, you know, for right now, when I need an egg because I'm baking cookies with my kids, and I would go to my neighbor's house, you know, I, in the future, um, possibly could then 
just order it in San Juan and deliver it right away, and then have that delivery come um, pretty quickly. Uh, and I, I, I want to just think a little bit too about, um, you know, so as we are purchasing more and more things online, at the same time, uh, we're seeing the retail environment really change across the country. Uh, right now, about um, probably a little less than a third of the malls um, in the country are kind of at risk for closing. Um, and we've definitely seen quite a few big box stores that have gone bankrupt for a variety of reasons, but definitely e-commerce is not helping. Many are in a lot of debt and haven't been able to work their way out of it. Um, there was about 7,000 stores that closed in 2017, uh, which was more uh, than closed during the Great Recession. So a real kind of shift in the retail environment. Um, and kind of what we're seeing also is uh, this change to experiential retail. So uh, this is a mall that's in Cupertino, and the proposal is to replace kind of this dead and dying mall um, and replace it with uh, a much more vibrant um, uh, uh, development. And so this one would have about 2,400 housing units, and about half of those would be affordable housing. Um, Remembering my numbers correctly, I think there's another 400,000 square feet of entertainment uh, and uh, and food uh, places and retail, and then over 1.8 million square feet of office space. So um, a lot of the malls around the country uh, uh, they develop about every 20 years, and these days the improvements that are going in, uh, at least uh, the most common improvement is uh, for food and drink. Um, so people are definitely going out, and you know they want to have um, you know a great a great meal, and then they might do some shopping while they're doing it, um, or they definitely want program space. Some places are putting yoga in, or you know kids parks. Uh, actually, entertainment for kids is really big too, and then housing is right up there as well. Uh, and our desire for two day delivery, and eventually maybe two hour delivery, um, is uh, definitely good news for people that have industrial land. Uh, and so we're seeing a real boom in the development of warehouses and that distribution network um, as these com uh, companies want to make sure that their goods are as close as possible to the larger metropolitan areas so they can get them uh, and deliver them uh, faster than they can. So since uh, roughly 2012, uh, industrial prices have actually uh, almost doubled in many locations around the country. Um, so as I said, I'm guessing a number of you have cars, mm -hmm. and what are those cars doing right now? Uh, they're probably parked, like mine, mine probably actually looks like that in the, the parking lot at the Portland Airport. Uh, our cars are parked about 95% of the time, so it's a real huge investment um, to stay stationary. Uh, and as we're thinking about this technology, though, one of the things that I think is really fascinating about it is that, uh, you know, whether it's an Uber or Lyft or a, an autonomous vehicle, eventually, um, they don't need to park in the same places I might want to park my own vehicle. Um, and so what becomes much more important is that drop-off and pickup zone. And so that the, it goes, it sh you, we're starting to see a shift in the demand for parking. Um, and right now it's primarily at airports because uh, more and more people are taking Ubers to Lyft to airports, uh, as well as uh, folks that are going out at night and don't want to drive drunk. It's uh, much less expensive to, uh, to have somebody else drive you, and it's, it's much more prevalent um, than it was before. Uh, and I find it really fascinating talking to, to transportation planners um, and people that uh, give advice on parking, and so the, the fine folks that are up have a, are predicting peak parking, um, where that demand still might be going up today because we have minimum parking standards for our developments. Um, but really they see with these emerging technologies that it's probably gonna peak and that demand is gonna start to go down. So they are, uh, they are recommending to their clients to build the minimum amount of parking that you can get away with. And then to really think about your developments and how you put them on the lots so that you can redevelop uh, those parking lots at some point in the future. Um, and so, which is fairly easy if you've got a surface parking lot, 
But then if you, uh, you know, if you have to do any kind of structured parking, then really think about, are you going to deconstruct that at some point in the future? Um, so don't have it connected to the building itself where you've got your, your uses. Um, or to think about how you might be able to repurpose that. There's still the need for, um, and right now the estimates are maybe uh, you know, 10 to 20% of the parking that we already have that we will still need for those autonomous vehicles or other specialized vehicles, um, like you know, ambulances or uh, you know, for um, companies that are doing landscaping. There's, you know, there's definitely those kind of commercial uses for vehicles as well. And they'll need a place to get charged um, as well as to get cleaned and maintained, uh, things like that. And so um, it's been real fascinating to think about how those uses could be, uh, those uses could be repurposed. And so if you're in, you know, one of the, the large uh, cities across the country, um, many cities like Portland, where I'm from, uh, have changed from minimum parking requirements to maximum parking requirements. And they're really allowing the market to determine, you know, how much parking is really needed. And so, you know, in that kind of a, a place, you know, there's not a lot of service parking right now. So, and most of those that house some of our best food carts uh, are in the process of redevelopment. So we're definitely seeing that demand in kind of those central locations. But if you're in kind of a more suburban area or somewhere not in that central downtown like Gresham, which is on the eastern side of the Portland metropolitan area, then your land development patterns look a little bit different. And you've got a lot of opportunities, um, which is great if you've got a high demand for development. But if you don't, so it might be probably still pretty good in Gresham, but if you're in a Rust Belt state or um, in other places around the country where there's not that kind of demand, then just putting more developable land um, you know, out to the market is, is not good for your property values, it's not good for your property taxes. So it has real kind of financial implications of, of how things are likely to be disrupted and changed. Um, I mentioned you know, the possibility of repurposing some parking uh, garages. Um, and so some folks are really starting to think about that now as they develop new ones because there's a lot of things that have to change. And most of our parking garages, you can't redevelop into something else because the floor to ceiling height is too low and you need that space for uh, you know, water and uh, sewer and uh, you know, uh, air, electrical services, things like that in a building that has people in it. Um, the ramps that are, you know, if you have any uh, floors that are sloped uh, are not good for people that want to live on a slope. Um, and there's other kinds of systems and even support and engineering that a, a parking garage is not really built to be then redeveloped into office or residential or, or retail. Um, so some folks are starting to think about well, maybe we need to invest up front um, and plan for those um, parking uh, garages to develop into something else in the future. Uh, so, so this is pretty exciting for me to really think about, you know, as I was saying earlier today, uh, you know, as a planner, usually what we do is we look at the past and we make some assumptions that, you know, uh, that what has happened in the past, you know, that's kind of what the future is going to look somewhat like that. And we'll make a few, we'll fuzz around the edges here and make some adjustments. But um, with this new technology that our phones enable us to achieve, there's some real fundamental changes that happen. And it definitely allows, um, as the demand for parking goes down, it allows our kind of commercial areas and downtowns where people want to be, to be much denser. It means we can put things a lot closer together and make it easier to walk and to, if we build our streets right, to bike. Um, and really be able to get around and build that kind of vitality and interest. Uh, and it has some implications too. I'm not sure how many office parks you have that might have acres and acres of parking, but a lot of those new employees might not be coming with their own personal vehicle at some point in the future. So that we'll probably see some other changes even in suburban areas. And there's a real opportunity um, for housing and to think about what do our communities need and where's there um, opportunities to put housing close to 
either um, transit or to schools or to um, closer to jobs? How can we really make some of those changes and build the kind of communities that we want? Uh, and it has real implications for streets because we're going to be using streets differently than we have in the past. And so um, transportation engineers are starting to think about, you know, how do you arrange things so that our autonomous vehicles um, still make it safe for people to walk or to bike um, or folks that are getting them on and off of public transit, but they're not, you know, running them over. Um, and so there's some real questions. Are they going to have their, you know, is an autonomous vehicle going to have its own lane? And do we need to do something different for scooters? Like, what, is this, what does this really look like? Uh, so the folks at the um, <coughs> National Association of um, City Transportation Officials, NACDO, uh, have done a little bit of thinking about this. And I love their modeling around it and really kind of thinking about, you know, kind of what's a, a typical street section and what's the, the capacity of that section. Um, kind of at its peak, and so for this example they gave, you know, you can probably get about 30,000 people per um, hour through that section in a typical car and with bus on the side. Um, but let's think about the future, and what's the possibility, say, with the timeless vehicles and with some higher capacity transit, and you can get so many more people through that corridor um, if we configure things differently, and you can potentially do it a little end in a much more pleasant atmosphere by building, you know, uh, or planting trees and making the sidewalks uh, larger, and you can make it definitely much more interesting and hopefully a lot safer. Um, so, and if our cities actually become denser, like there's the potential for them to, then the only way to get the capacity of people through is by considering that high capacity transit. So it's it's having to be forth, you know, thinking into the future of what our cities could potentially look like, and then how do you actually move them around? Uh, like I said, folks are starting to envision what this might look like. So Lyft has partnered with a firm called uh, Perkins and & Will, and they envision what Wilshire Boulevard down in Los Angeles could potentially look like. Um, and so it's been really interesting. And uh, again, I think it's important to really think about how we access the curb and the drop off and pick up, and, and making sure that we get that right, because if we don't, then there's a new fresh hell that's awaiting uh, anyone who has dropped off or picked up kids from an elementary school um, in the recent past has probably experienced um, the potential for having any of those places where everybody wants to be there at the same time, and to have that kind of backup uh, is, is pretty extreme. And uh, definitely you're starting to see that kind of congestion just with uh, the TMCs, the transportation network companies like Uber and Lyft, and some of the largest metropolitan areas, stuff like San Francisco is experiencing it, um, New York, Washington, D.C., places like that. Uh, so I, on one side, I've, I've focused, I know so far, really on thinking about, you know, our, our central cities um, and, you know, what our downtowns might potentially look like. But now we have, say, an autonomous vehicle, uh, you know, the opportunity to do something other than driving in there. You know, we could actually take a, an office phone call. Uh, back in the 60s, they thought we would be playing Scrabble. Uh, or, uh, you know, we could binge watch uh, Game of Thrones, which is one of my favorites. Um, and so, uh, some of the modeling has suggested that people are going to be much more willing to go even farther out than live farther away um, if they can still have that comfortable kind of private ride into wherever they need to go. Um, and so, if you want to live in the woods, or if you want to live kind of in a more suburban location, then, uh, you know, it really allows you that ability to, to live even farther and farther away, which again kind of has implications for the congestion and the total vehicle miles traveled that we might end up doing on our roads. Um, and also, uh, it's, you know, I talk about this as being almost like a domino. Uh, and you can sometimes can't anticipate all the different changes that are likely to happen. Um, but a lot of folks are starting to pay attention because uh, autonomous vehicles are likely to be either hybrid or um, electric vehicles because there's so much um, electronics on board that have to be run. And so having a, a bigger battery pack uh, is really kind of one of the, the things that they need, which is great for the environment. Um, you know, having more electric vehicles is definitely a better way to get around than conventional 
uh, fuel vehicles. And so, uh, but of course, one of the ways we fund our roads is through a fuels tax. And so when um, uh, Ben Affleck stops uh, filling up his gas tank, uh, you know, how are we going to be uh, paying for our roads? And so there's uh, definitely in some of the strategies that um, places from around the country are starting to think about, they're also thinking about how do we, how do we price um, the vehicles in the future to make sure that the user is actually paying for the services they get for the roads that they're using. And so on one hand, you know, let's think about how we pay for our roads, but then there's also the opportunity to start paying for congestion. So if you're going to live really far out and, um, and you want to come in right, you know, during kind of peak commute hours and you're adding to that overall congestion, then, um, then it might make more sense to start to price that, to try to, to change that behavior. This is a real, you know, um, behavioral experiment that we're undergoing right now. We're just starting, um, and so it's going to be interesting kind of where the political will is going to come to, to make changes and, and see those levers start to change. Wow, that's, that's how exciting it really is. Um, all of this has implications for how we pay for public, um, public services and public infrastructure. It has implications for the, for the environment, not only greenhouse gas emissions, but think about air quality, uh, as well as uh, water quality, stormwater runoff. Um, you can even think about um, emergency services. Uh, you know, one of the things um, that I often talk about too is uh, kind of some of the unintended things you don't think about. But if, if these vehicles really are so much safer than our cars right now, then there's the whole crash economy. There's the uh, police and uh, um, emergency responders that won't have to respond to all of those crashes where people are hurt or, or, or killed. Uh, there's not the, um, the hospitals and the doctors and nurses that will then have to treat all of those people. Um, there's not the insurance or the lawyers that will then be you know, paying out claims or um, uh, filing lawsuits. So it's kind of this ripple effect of you know, a lot of different jobs start to change as well. And then finally, I think I implied, uh, you know, there's potentially changes on uh, land value and land valuation, um, as well as uh, our, our tax revenues as well. So kind of those rippling, um, rippling effects. So I'm hoping that I've impressed upon you that 80s are not a transportation issue, and e-commerce is not a retail issue. These are everything issues that really impact the way uh, government services are provided and um, um, everyone's lives. So at Urbanism Next, the University of Oregon, we're thinking about those secondary impacts um, and really thinking about, again, kind of some of those different levers that can be kind of pushed and pulled, uh, definitely around land use, uh, urban design, transportation, and then real estate, um, and really thinking about how you design your cities, how you regulate, and the laws that, um, that influence um, this technology and how it's actually uh, rolled out in communities. Uh, as well as you know how you could potentially price it to get the kinds of travel behavior that are that are really good for your community, uh, and it's thinking about those different levers are used, and really you know overall it's important to continue to think about uh, the overall outcomes that you end up getting from it, you know related to equity, um, and thinking about those most vulnerable people in your community and how this technology impacts them or doesn't. Uh, you know, if you don't have a smartphone and there's a lot of people that are unbanked or don't speak English or uh, don't have a credit card, uh, and so if their transport, their transit uh, options go away, how do they, how do they get around? Uh, there's health-related issues um, where if we have more and more people that are sitting in their cars, that's less opportunity to walk and bike and to get exercise moving around. The environmental uh, greenhouse, think about greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the economy is going to be a really interesting one. Uh, both thinking about retail, uh, the most common, often the most common job in a community is retail related, and e-commerce is definitely uh, increasing. Um, you know, they're they're hiring people, uh, but it's definitely in different places and, uh, and and not the same numbers. You don't see as many people in e-commerce as you do in like brick and mortar retail stores. So it's a, a reshuffling, and definitely people are not necessarily in the same places. Uh, you know, almost every community um, 
you know, has a, has a downtown and retail. Uh, there was an article that I read um, that from a, a postal worker in Idaho, and he was like, I, I knew that re e retail, you know, was really changing uh, things when I delivered a plain bottle of bleach up to somebody in some rural road. They weren't coming into town to purchase it, they were just ordering it online. And so, uh, you know, it's really kind of a fundamental change, and we're likely to see, I think the estimates are between a, like a, a 20 and 28% year-over-year year increase on online shopping, uh, at least for the next five years, and probably off into the future as well. So some real, some real big changes. Um, and finally, in governance. And this is where I get to work with um, cities, definitely in the Pacific Northwest, and hopefully around the country as well, thinking about you know, what are the, the policies and the programs and the pricing that you need to think about to make sure that this technology helps you achieve your community goals, and doesn't uh, create barriers for doing so. And so, of course, my motto is cities that think ahead and stay ahead. We really have to think about these secondary impacts and how they're going to impact our communities. Um, and not just enable the technology to come and to kind of, you know, drive over us. Uh, so as part of that, uh, the University of Oregon is doing a fair amount of research. Uh, we have a, a blogs, uh, a, a, blog uh, website uh, and we also do research reports and we're working on a clearinghouse and I think I'm almost done which seems like it's good <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> there, there goes the technology um, we have a, 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 a conference we had our first conference just this last year and uh, about 500 people from around the country came to talk about you know um, how this technology is impacting their cities and we're having our next one uh, next May. Um, and with that, I'm uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, 
Uh, and they're, um, of the, I think it's roughly $200 million that they've invested in the, their arena. Um, about, they're counting on about $60 million worth of parking fees to help to finance that. Um, and over the next 50 years, I can, I, I feel pretty confident, I'll probably be dead by then, I feel pretty confident though that they're not going to be able to, they're, they're not going to see those revenues um, into the future. And even already uh, in San Francisco, there's at least one or two downtown parking garages, um, and some of the revenues for that parking go towards parks. And they're already starting to see, like I'm gonna say the, the headline that I saw was like a 20% dip in, in parking um, uh, revenues. And so it was impacting you know, the park services that they could provide. Um, it might take a little bit longer to come to Santa Cruz, but again, I, you know, the, those trends seem to be, and I don't know how the city's planning on paying for it, but it seems like that parking is, if you're counting on any kind of revenues to pay for that, then it's becoming even more risky than it might have been in the past. But my question was, are the architects who design these buildings getting the message you're talking about? Because they're still designing bad parking structures. Um, well, it's definitely something that we're working on, uh, and so the University of Oregon has a really great architecture program, and our conference is actually a partnership with the American Institute of Architects, the American Society of Landscape Architects, the American Planning Association, uh, and the Urban Land Institute, so developers. So we're definitely trying to, to work with all of those professionals uh, that work in the built environment um, to really talk about these issues. Another thing that's really challenging also is the, is the banks and folks that finance developments. Because um, even in some of the places where they have maximum, you can't build more than this much amount of parking, but you could go, you know, you don't have to build any. Uh, even in those situations when developers say they want to maybe build just a little bit of parking, uh, the folks financing it say, no, you have to build more. We don't think your development is going to be um, viable unless unless you do build more. So there's there's a variety of folks you really have to convince that there's a different kind of future. Uh, I'm going to take the gentleman in the hat. Uh, I, I, I'd like to refer to uh, the, uh, the parking structure, I think, uh, gets uh, evident a direction from your planning department. And uh, they kind of lead your architects. So, you know, I think we have a problem with our planning planners here. Uh, with another issue that you uh, referred to is uh, what they call smart streets. Mm -hmm. uh, like they had in, uh, everywhere is going around with that, particularly Oregon, uh, in your uh, city. But uh, skepticism uh, was with it is that uh, supposedly people in high density amongst uh, street corridors are going to take mass transit, but they don't. And uh, because they have parking, and that's what you had in uh, Portland. You eliminated parking, and you had a cry out from the public, we want parking. <laughs> we don't want to drive the cars. But I think we should refer, uh, if I might, not into this stuff, <laughs> as you can see. But uh, uh, I think we have a uh, right now, we're talking about all these options that people drive. And it gets down to the juggernaut that we have was uh, Highway 1 and 17. And what's the solution to that problem? I mean, I have an idea. But, uh, you know, it, it's all over the uh, all over the country, in all the cities. They have tremendous congestion. And, of course, CO2s, and we're talking about global yeah. warming. Yeah, there's probably nothing that induces driving more than having parking lots. And there's there's probably nothing that in, that kind of increases the overall traffic and congestion than having the parking lots. Yeah, because it always makes it the more convenient yeah. and often the more comfortable way of getting around. Again, this comes from your planners. They allow parking. It's uh, and we have this right here on our, in our main <laughs> corridors where they call smart streets, but it's uh -huh. not going to work. Um, you know, it definitely takes time for anything to change. We didn't build, you know, this over, you know, it's taken us probably, really, uh, probably like a 40 year period to kind of get where we are today. 
And again, I think where I'm so excited about this and where we see it definitely in some of these larger cities is that we have a real um, opportunity and um, and I definitely see it among the, um, the changes you see in the younger generation. Like when you look at who's using kind of an Uber or Lyft um, or a scooter or even the bike share or biking around, there's definitely a large portion of people that are younger that are doing it and they're kind of flocking back to cities because they want to live in communities where it's easier to walk and bike. And if you can make that easy and, um, and convenient and affordable, then people will do it. And the city of Seattle is probably probably one of the best examples. They have passed a number of um, uh, bond measures uh, over the last, like just even couple of years. They're investing in their transit. They're making it much more convenient. And that is one of the places where transit use is going up and automobile use is going down. They're putting, um, they're building housing and they're putting it closer to their downtown. So it makes it easier and closer and more convenient to be able to take that transit and, uh, and be able to get where they need to go. So it takes, think about the billions of dollars we've invested in our roads and in our parking. So it's no wonder people are, are, are driving because we've made it incredibly easy for them. We need to make transit and biking and walking just as easy. So speaking of biking, can you speak to any efforts um, to make e-bike charging more standardized and more accessible? Um, today I spent about 20 minutes hunting around my workplace for a place to plug in my bike and it ended up working, but it struck me as, a, as kind of an edge case. Yeah, actually, um, there's a number of cities, uh, again, I think Seattle's probably one of the leaders, um, that are talking about mobility hubs. And so really thinking about how kind of this uh, new mobility environment um, really works together. And so how can we make sure that we, you know, build locations where you can get transit, but then you can also um, park your e-bike, or uh, you can get your e-scooter, um, or, you know, you can, you can easily change from one mode to another. Um, and so there's definitely more and more efforts, I think, to really think about that. And cities, um, if they haven't already, a lot of them are starting to develop uh, more of an um, e-vehicle, uh, electric vehicle strategies, and really thinking about the infrastructure that goes in. And so a number of places around the country, and, and this is, I know, kind of geared towards cars, but I think um, more localities, especially as e-bike uh, uh, use increases, you know, it's, that's something that's relatively easy to start including in their building codes or in their parking codes so that even if they're not requiring necessarily the charging, they'll say, you know, put in the conduit so it's really easy for you to be able to just hook, hook it up in the future um, as that demand starts to increase. Come over here. Uh, I try to avoid the uh, driving around the Bay Area as much as I can. However, when I went up to the East Bay this summer, I was very distraught that they had the uh, high occupancy vehicle lanes. I don't know if this is happening in other places, if this is like a trend. Um, so you could be in a high occupancy vehicle lane if you paid. And I thought, wow, that's an equity issue. Like what, the poor people are stuck in the traffic over here. And so that was upsetting. But then when now it seems like I just read a headline quickly that now that this feature is available, the, the fast lane isn't fast anymore, so it's you know all gridlock. Is this sort of a new idea that like other places are adopting, or are they realizing they're following? Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of discussion around uh, around how we usually don't price um, our our roads and definitely a great place to look for more information is Joe Portwright and City Observatory. I think he's doing some really excellent work in this area. And uh, one of his arguments is the price is wrong. Um, and his example is the Ben and Jerry's free ice cream day. Uh, and uh, which is a lot, uh, that's a, kind of his comparison to the way that we price our roads. That on free ice cream day, you know, we're wait, willing to wait in this really incredible, you know, like long line so that we can get our free ice cream. Um, just like when we're driving around, uh, you know, we, our roads, quote unquote, are free, and so we, we spend our, we pay with our time instead of paying specifically, and, and that has a value to it too, so um, I definitely want to say that you, know, you don't actually spend money on that, but it's making that realization that we uh, the price is wrong, that we haven't priced our roads 
um, in a way that really makes sense. And uh, where pricing, I think, really works, um, and for those people who want that and are willing to pay for it, then you take some of that money and you make sure that the other people that don't have that financial opportunity, um, you start to invest in the transit or, or the other ways that um, lower income people or disadvantaged populations can and make it much easier for them to get around. So it it's means pricing the roads right and then also in making wise investments so they can really help all people in your community. It's not easy. This is really hard stuff. You know, if it was easy, we would have figured it out. We wouldn't have any gesture, but, but we haven't. So, but there's the two gentlemen. I'll take the, the one with the, well, you both have glasses right there. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, just on that, on that last uh, subject, in the, in the Bay Area, they're talking about expanding Highway 101 and have a toll, another toll lane uh, where the cost of the, the toll money is going to go largely to widen the highway. So I don't know how much it's going to get to transit. Uh, but, but actually, my, my question is about your comment that, um, you know, one or two futures where uh, automated vehicles might be uh, ride services and fleets of vehicles and less private ownership in another scenario where there's lots of private ownership and people are driving even farther because they don't mind. Um, what can locality, what can local communities like ours do in the near future to steer in one direction rather than the other? Um, you know what, more and more of uh, communities, um, it, it's been really interesting and I would say I have the most experience with the city of Portland uh, that has both bike share and then um, e-scooters and they're coming back and then as well as the transportation network companies. And there's definitely been this evolution where the, the planners there used to say, you know, we thought about all these different modes as just being very separate. We'd have to come up with different regulations for each of them. And they're finding actually the fundamentals really start to flow across them all. And so the importance of um, thinking about, you know, how does this impact everyone? So thinking about the equity related impacts. Um, also uh, thinking about the kinds of data that you need, uh, because it's really hard to manage what you can't measure. Um, and so, for example, for the e-commerce deliveries, there's almost nobody who is measuring that or has that kind of information about how many deliveries are being made. Um, so it's very anecdotal or very kind of a spot by spot basis. Um, so starting to work with those technology companies to say, you know, what kind of information do we need so that we can make wise investments in the millions of dollars we're investing in just transportation infrastructure in our communities. Um, and then build into it that pricing. Uh, so when the city of Portland came up with its e-scooter policy, they built into that that the companies have to give them 25 cents for every ride that's taken on an e-scooter. And it's more important to, 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 to put into that that there, there's going to be some charge, um, and you can figure out exactly what that charge might be, but it's, more, it's harder to say no charge or charge than it is to say one cent to you know, $100 per charge. So, so building into it, you know, that ability to price at some, either immediately or at some point in the future. Um, and really, again, I would say, you know, having conversations with folks in Arizona that saw this as, you know, and they really had welcomed in the autonomous vehicle testing with open arms, their kind of anti-regulation, um, and they saw some economic development opportunity that they were gonna get all this, you know, technology money. And, uh, and also they have really wide open roads and you know, no ice or snow. It's, you know, it's a really great place for autonomous vehicles to test. Um, but you know, uh, really I would say be clear about what your goals are. Because if you don't want to see more congestion, then build that in. You, you can cap the number of vehicles that are in your city. You can really think about, you know, what kinds of things can you do to increase shared rights? Um, and there's regulations and some, some promising pra I say best practices, because I would say this is an area that's really developing, but there's definitely promising practices around that, and pay attention. Um, again, I would say the, the leaders in this area right now are both Seattle and Los Angeles. There's definitely other places around the country that are thinking about all of these. Um, these topics, but those two are probably have done more thinking about it than any other place around the country. So pay attention to that. I'm, I'm going to take the gentleman right next to you. Well, thank you. Uh, 
So uh, parking structures in particular are uh, revenue streams for cities. And uh, so, so uh, I just uh, would you mind commenting on, on that aspect. Uh, uh, city planners need to plan for their retirement and, and their future employment as much as anyone else. Oh yeah, the um, city of Portland I know has about $50 million a year that they get in parking revenue. And so, uh, you know, it has a huge impact, uh, and that's just the city of Portland. Um, uh, gosh, there's a slide that I've got in another presentation uh, where you look at, uh, they did a survey of just how much revenue was uh, raised from citations, so either parking citations or, you know, moving violations, um, to, uh, you know, parking revenues. And parking revenues far and away, I would say, is, uh, you know, out of all these different other kind of transportation-related um, uh, uh, revenue streams, uh, you know, raises more money in the top like 25 metropolitan areas than any of the other ones combined, like maybe by a scale of two or three. And so it's, <coughs> and um, states and eventually the, the feds are going to have to think of a whole new way of funding infrastructure and, and for paying for these things that right now are, are paid through, through these sources. And there's nothing that's more fun than coming up with a new tax or fee, then maybe deciding how much parking you're going to build. That's going to be your runner up in the back. So, my question, uh, my thought classification is emergency first responder. And my concern is how do we get these autonomous vehicles out of our way so that we can respond to an emergency? Oh, you know, there's fascinating stuff. Well, that's the second, my question. Oh, okay, go ahead. We'll start that question. So, in the event of a natural disaster or man made catastrophe, if we lose technology, which technology is vulnerable to crashing, yeah. how do we ensure that the autonomous vehicles that are not occupied by somebody who can drive know to get out of the way of the fire truck being able to the police car and also know where to safely pull over to get out of the way of that vehicle? Because if there's no real human driver there, how do they know that that's, you can squeeze your vehicle in there and give that fire truck an approach? Electric vehicles are great. I've got to say that uh, I've been a champion of uh, electric vehicles, and in fact, I started patrolling next week on an electric motorcycle. It's made in Scottsdale, great deal. But I also live in a very remote area, very narrow roads. I don't see how an autonomous vehicle can get down my street windstorm, I've had wires that have come down that are windshield height. Would an autonomous vehicle be able to detect all the obstacles? And what would its solution be? To turn and avoid it? Or just shut down and stop like they currently do now? So how do we make sure that our roads can be clear in case of a disaster or an emergency <coughs> so the emergency vehicles can respond? Those are really good questions. <laughs> and um, they are some, uh, so I'm actually on a statewide uh, autonomous vehicle task force for the state of Oregon. That's a legislative task force, and they're working right now primarily on enabling legislation. And there's definitely uh, uh, roles at the federal, state, and the local level. At the federal level, um, you know, usually they uh, have you know safety regulations to make sure that your car is safe and you know seatbelt laws and or not the, the laws again to click it or ticket, but the, um, you know, having a seatbelt and just how the car is designed. Uh, and then at the state level is all of the, you know, um, there's, there's usually all the, the licensing and registration and insurance and liability and some of those kinds of things. At the local level, it's the environment that the, you know, that's what we really regulate. Um, and so, like, like I said, I, I know more, a lot more about the secondary impacts and thinking about those than the technology themselves. Uh, it's definitely something that the car companies um, are, are, are thinking about, and they have uh, protocols, and when I talk to the folks at Waymo, you know, they do um, training with the emergency providers, and especially um, uh, police, uh, because the cars can both um, register the sirens, and they can also see um, the, and register the, um, the lights, and so, and they have a, a protocol, and they will stay pulled over um, while the vehicle is behind, but I think that there are some, a few things that the responders have to do to basically signal that. So it's like, yeah. it's it's not it's not like how we do it now. Well, in an emergency situation, it's like where it is. 
we've had problems where the roads have been so narrow, yeah. but we've had to get through in seconds matter. Yeah. Uh, that people have actually pulled their vehicles up onto the sidewalk in order to let the emergency responders through. Would an autonomous vehicle know that you can pull up onto a sidewalk in an emergency? We can't have somebody trying to drive all these vehicles. It's, it's an interesting idea, but yeah. uh, it's one that could also create great problems, too. Yeah, and that, that is what I do not know the answer to. So, in the, the back. But I think it's one that you need to keep on asking. So these are clearly rapidly evolving and challenging times. And of course, here in Santa Cruz, we have a terrible inequity in our highway. People who live in South County are definitely suffering at a disproportionate level than people that live in North County in terms of how they're stuck in with that larger than the Silicon Valley in the community. Um, and we have um, we have the rail corridor, which is a narrow corridor. It's another polarizing conversation here in the town, trying to figure out what to do with that. And my question is, as we're in this very transition tra transitionary time, and we're looking toward the future, and we would like to help people stuck in the traffic right now, we also need to think about humans, right? So, is prioritizing between transit walking, biking, on e-bikes, trying to make way to promote not just not just make it safer now, but also make it so much safer that you'll have that 50 to 60 percent of people who are interested and concerned and not currently getting on a bike, actually transitioning to bikes soon, because it's something that can happen soon. How are other places transitioning? I, I know um, I was at the Silicon Valley Bike Summit, there was young men who's an active transportation in Seattle. And he spoke about how Seattle, probably like Portland, I'm imagining, is embracing millennials mm -hmm. and you know putting in transit and protected bike lane as quickly as possible. They're not doing paint on the roads. They're not doing the type of bikes that stuff they're settling for here because they actually want to get a whole new crowd of people on the bike and they want to meet the demands of the younger population and build a city that's welcoming younger people where it feels like Santa Cruz is building a city for rich retirees <laughs> and vacationers. So I'm just curious, how do we, what, what do, how do we prioritize between making really safe places for people walking and biking and also trying to put in transit for the future? There's definitely improvements that have to be done to the infrastructure itself so it is safer and more convenient to walk, but you're not gonna get the kind of change that you're really looking for until you really change your land use patterns. And people today are driving because they have to, not necessarily because they want to. Um, because things are really spread out and we do have large parking lots and we make you know, all these different uses you know, really far apart or we are commuting to jobs that are really far away or our schools are far away. Um, and you, you're never gonna get to to the, the kind of, you know, different types of behaviors that you're looking for until you really make those different types of places that you want to go closer together. And often that means, um, you know, with, you know, it's, it's kind of that magic, you know, within a mile or two. The, with e-bikes and e-scooters, actually that starts to be like almost like a three mile kind of radius where you're more likely to get that kind of behavior. But, but if you have them at your housing close to your shops and your schools, and your jobs, then you're never going to get the uptake in bike and walk that you are really looking for in your community. It, it just makes it so, so much harder. So it's it's both a transportation and a land use um, change that has to be made. So then, far back, take your hand. Well, I'm not sure. Uh, it's sort of more of a statistical aberration to how cities would evolve and it just happened to be the mankind that Barricats and I was around there at that time and kind of made decisions and just kind of just happened to, to work for an old timber town that managed to modernize without the baggage that, that other cities would have. As opposed to, I know people who commute from, let's say, Gresham, as you're familiar with, to uh, uh, Lake Oswego. And the commutes are terrible, and yet, the image you're putting in is, is if everybody's concentrated around Portland downtown kind of thing. And so I'm at a kind of a, a loss of words or thought of, of how to bridge those disparate pictures. Yeah, oh, 
yeah, I mean, it's brilliant for me because I live, you know, three and a half miles from downtown and I can uh, follow out my front door and onto a bus and it takes me exactly where I want to go within usually 25 minutes. Um, but it's definitely not that way for everybody in the Portland metro area. And there's horrible traffic. Uh, and there's, you know, horrendous commutes. Um, but, uh, and this is where Joe Courtright has the numbers and I can't pull them out of my head at the moment, but you know, on average, you know, uh, the average Portland person uh, travels, I, th I think he needs roughly five miles less, uh, something in that, I don't have it exactly right, but it's you know, roughly in that proportion. Um, then the average American commutes and spends less time commuting, and so they save that portion of money, and it ends up being, I think, millions of dollars every year that you can spend on something else. Um, you know, I, I think the stars aligned in the 70s, and some really good decisions were made, um, but you have just as much kind of sprawl and sprawl developments uh, throughout kind of Portland and the Portland metro area, so you, you have you have bits of both, and it it really it really takes some hard decisions, and it's hard to get everybody to or enough people to agree um, to make it happen. So, and, and that's a, a challenge we have in Oregon um, today as well. So, and I, I think we're probably getting close to our time. Um, quarter to eight. Quarter to eight. I'm not sure how much more time we have, but. Uh, but I'm happy to, to keep on talking. I'm going to try to get people that haven't talked yet. I have a quick question along equity lines. The uh, land use patterns are well established in our community, and, and the job centers are well established, and those will take a long time to change. And right now, many people in our community, they, they sort of they drive until they can afford to live. And so the distance they have to travel is directly proportional to their income ability. And many of those people, there really isn't uh, an option. Uh, so in terms of thinking about transit, you know, uh, how do we, you know, what, what forms of transit uh, will best solve that equity problem? I realize it's be better if everybody moves to the city, but until that happens, uh, is mass transit the, the one solution? Is buses better than trains? Are, you know, what what's, What's the mix? Is there a mix that addresses the equity <laughs> deaths? You know, the best solution is to build a lot more housing in the places where people want to live. Uh, um, which I know doesn't really answer your question because it's, it's you know, and, and you see it in the marketplace, you know, it's kind of the demand and supply. And, you know, in the Portland metro area, we're finally actually, there's, you know, thousands of units that have come on since the recession. Um, since the height of the recession, and we're finally starting to see, with those new units coming on, like prices are starting to flatline and start to actually go down. Um, it just, that will make such a bigger difference um, than not doing it. Um, and so there's definitely, you can look at the different types of, of transit, and of course, fixed you know, rail transit, light rail, um, is some of the most expensive kinds of transit that you can purchase. Buses are so much less expensive. And there's bus rapid transit, which um, I don't know if you're familiar with, but uh, it almost kind of acts a little bit more like a train. They often have dedicated lanes, and they do light signalization, and so they prioritize the bus. Um, and uh, you know anything they can do to help that bus move faster than the surrounding traffic um, makes it that much that makes it that much faster. And that's something else, too, actually, to think about, especially with autonomous vehicles, because, of course, we could prioritize, you know, buses and bus systems and say, you know, if you're in a single occupancy vehicle, then you have to give, you know, you have to give the right of way to the buses that come through. Like, there's, there's all this kind of programming that we could potentially do to make the movement through traffic more equitable. And, again, incentivize, you know, that which makes the system much more efficient. And you, so, probably not that familiar with our community or our neighborhood or our city, uh, and just as a geography, but a good example would be, say, somebody lives in Fremont, they work in San Francisco, which is going to be cheaper for them to take BART, buy a BART ticket, or hire a Uber? And on top of that, the other thing you have to consider, too, is without massively expanding the roadways, adding more vehicles to the roads are, is not really eliminating congestion. 
you put buses on the road for our communities here, you put three or four buses on Mission Street, it's not going to help the community at all. <laughs> but everybody took the buses and it would. It's about getting them beyond our current. It is. Right? But the problem is, is that you've got to realize that for the person who is a blue collar worker, low income, they're thinking about every penny. They're not going to be able to hire the Uber drivers to drive them to and from everywhere. They're going to need to take mass transit. Certainly, the idea that communities are built closer together is the way we should go. Housing, works, jobs, everything should be all close together. <coughs> yeah. You know, one of the things that um, is really fascinating as well, and it's kind of like, you know, what, what, what will our phones our smartphones, you know, allow us to do in the future. And there's some real kind of different financial models as well. So in Helsinki, there's an app called uh, WIM. And uh, it's basically a subscription service. And so you can do, a, you know, a, a, and it, it includes bike share, transit, kind of a, a Uber taxi service, and then a, a personal car. And so you can just do it pay as you go. There's a, roughly a $50 a monthly subscription that gets you unlimited bike and transit, and then an unlimited number of car by, for a certain limit, um, you know, either personal or, or shared taxis. Um, or the, for roughly, I think it's the equivalent, uh, it's 499 euros, which I think is just under $600 a month, you can get unlimited everything. And the thing that's interesting, when you look at actually how much money we spend on our vehicles in the United States, Americans spend about $800 a month on their transportation. And so it buys a lot of Uber trips. Um, and well, totally about depending about on where you live, it changes. We're talking about a train trip, a train ticket, the low income. Or my phone here, I think she said it was much cheaper yeah. than train. Buses, are, buses uh, systems can be cheaper, but in the long run, train tickets are going to be cheaper for the distance. The distance you're going to travel is also but the other thing too is spicy. Yeah. Do you speak up? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things we're talking about too is bicycling in these communities. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand in Portland, you have a thing that we don't have very often down here. It's called rain. <laughs> and I'm just curious as to how many people actually do that bicycle commute on a daily basis in the rainy season. My husband does it every single day. I am totally a fair weather biker, and when it starts to get dark, that's when I get on the bus. That's totally when I switch. Um, but it's, you know, so it's, it's kind of amazing how many people will, you know, if they find a way what works and they're comfortable with it, um, but it really depends on the individual. So I'm, I'm not as familiar with all the different options, and, you know, we definitely, again, have a priced, you know, the people who, who drive, um, you know, if, if you don't have a car, you're still paying for all that uh, infrastructure. You know, you're paying through your property taxes and all these other fees, and the amount of time that you're still stuck in congestion when you're you're on the bus. Um, so we haven't priced it compared to the cost that it's actually incurring. And and I think there's going to be a real shift and change as as these new modes become more and more prevalent. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts. Uh, here in the county. A few years back, they did a feasibility study, and they still haven't given up on it, of expanding our Highway State Route 1 freeway by adding two more lanes. And that estimate was going to be something like, and, and, and traffic management features and timing on, on ramps and all that. It was going to cost something like $640 million. And I'm thinking, what could we do with $640 million to build affordable housing where the jobs are? It could go a tremendous amount to build housing close to where the jobs are, and people would be commuting on that freeway. And study after study has shown why the freeway it fills up again. Interstate 405 in, in Los Angeles is supposed to be with that. They widen the freeway across the one point. One, $1.2 billion and five years of construction. And when they finished, the congestion was worse than when they started. Yep. They had lanes, they had bus lanes. I the question. Well, the question is, how do the planners avoid screwing it up? Uh, even, even the smartest people make bad predictions about the future. Like in Eugene, mm -hmm. they did a bus rapid transit system. Yep. 
And one of the lines goes from Springfield to North Springfield. And the ridership is so low, they're cutting back on the service. Mm -hmm. uh, people just want to ride it. And, and in other places, it's expanding. Yeah. It's an so yeah. the, my question is, it's difficult to preach, you know, plan for the future. How do they avoid screwing it up? That is so hard. It's really hard. Um, and, and with these newer technologies, uh, we find more and more cities that are doing pilot projects and trying to study from those. So look at these scooters in Portland. It's a four, they, the companies um, had to uh, apply for their permit. Uh, they had to tell them what their workforce plan was and their equity plan. Um, they had to be able to comply with these different things. And then it only runs for four months. They have to give the data to the city so the city can actually look at what are the impacts of this and how does it affect our community. Um, and then they're going to make changes to that, and they're starting to learn from that and then update the regulations for their um, for the Uber and Lyft companies when they come in for their yearly permit. So this has been a really kind of fluid um, area, and a lot of folks have said, we don't, we don't have any idea how autonomous vehicles are going to be used in the future. And so let's do pilots and testing and do it on a small scale before we start to expand it even wider. And so we're seeing kind of more and more of those types of pilot projects. And that even happens, you know, it doesn't even have to be kind of fancy technology. There's um, a lot of places are doing road diets where they actually uh, reduce the number of lanes. Um, and it's usually, um, I call it planning with paint because it's things that you can just do, you know, really inexpensively. You do the test for, a, you know, a couple of months or six months and then you actually measure, you know, what's the rate of congestion, did it make it worse, did it make it better? Um, and it's not permanent, you can always put it back to the way it was, but if it's better, then you can then make some of your, um, you know, you can actually make the, the more substantial investments to make that improvement um, a more permanent thing. So hopefully we're learning, but you know, it, it takes time, like, you know, we don't, we don't replace roads every other day because it's really expensive. And so it takes time to redevelop kind of the community. All right. Uh, this might be the last question. <laughs>
more people who do it, and I just don't know the, the most current numbers, so I couldn't really tell you like the total impact on it. But um, yeah, so I, I just I just don't know enough to really I'd be shooting from the head. Okay. So I prefer not to. Yeah. All right. Quick, quick question. Okay. Quick question for an answer. Uh, Oregon was doing an experiment. You're talking about the gasoline tax. Mm -hmm. Cars get more fuel economy and hybrids and electric and all that. Yep. That's not going to be a good source of revenue. Oregon was doing an experiment with pay per mile. Yes. How did that go? Is it still doing it or is it going to be yes. expanded or expanded? Yeah, they are, um, it's Orgo uh, is the, um, is the, the pilot project, and I want to say it's been going on for about four years now, and it is uh, still continuing. And uh, I believe that they're planning on using it as part of, um, they've been studying in the Portland metro area uh, congestion pricing on some of our major freeways. And, uh, and, and they definitely recognize that they need to do something about congestion in the Portland metro area. Um, and I believe that they're, they're thinking about how do they incorporate that. Um, especially with the different kinds of emerging technology, I think more and more folks are going to be thinking about that vehicle, like a vehicle mile travel tax. But have people signed up for it because it's optional? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, it's still voluntary because it's still just a pilot project. So, um, uh, and I forget kind of where they are in thinking about um, a larger rollout, but I would say it's still very much alive and they're kind of in the middle of the next round of it. I, I suspect they'll be doing some testing and continue to, to test different things um, uh, for, for a while. I think it's only going to take a little while. But if the time as vehicles come sooner, then I think that we'll, we'll start to see um, a lot of different, we'll, we'll see the interest really increase in that. So, all right. All right. So, I think that was almost pretty soon. <laughs> Many of these options that you've given us is still rubber on the same streets, still in the same congestion. Bus lanes, <coughs> same thing. Buses are still in traffic. If something happens on that road, an automobile accident, a mudslide, everybody still gets stopped. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it make sense, as I think you're presenting, to have multiple tools in our toolbox, and therefore a dedicated rail line is also very advantageous if it goes through the communities and can serve serve areas. It seems to me that a dedicated rail line is not putting more cars on the road, it's not creating more congestion, and can be, if it's handed by outright, can be an extremely efficient form of public, public transportation. Um, yeah, I mean, you definitely see that in Europe and in Asian countries, uh, you know, and it's been um, harder, I would say, in the U.S. just because our communities are so spread out, the country's really big. Uh, we haven't really made it easy with our land use patterns. Um, but isn't that all future planning? Is yeah, it really else? is. Really um, is. Bars and everything else is all... Yeah, if I was in charge, <laughs> it's entirely different. Uh, but I'm not in charge. Lots of people are. And getting all those people uh, and the stars to align is, I mean, we see the remnants of the sausage making of policy on a pretty regular basis, and we all have to live with it, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, yeah, unintended consequences sometimes. In the back. <laughs> that, that's you. <laughs> um, so you're speaking of the Regional Transportation Commission, I believe, tomorrow? The meeting was canceled, oh, yes. so I'm not going to be able to, but I'm going to be speaking to their staff. Oh, okay. Um, just a request that it, it seems to me, you know, uh, Tim mentioned that there is still a legacy plan to widen Highway 1. $650 million, probably closer to a billion dollars now. Yeah. Uh, in the line of uh, advent of automated vehicles, it seems to me there, there's an argument that, hey, you might just want to hold off on that investment. Uh, they're, they're, they want to do the first down payment on a $100 million project very soon because they have the money for that. Uh, but if you could uh, mention induced travel when you're talking to staff, you know, that would be my request. I'd be happy to do that. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know how much influence I'll have, but... Um. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you bet. With that, one more question if you want, but that's it. Yeah. Go ahead. On Highway 17, and you're, you know, I, look, I like you and all that stuff about land use. Yeah, we, but land use has 
not been doing its job. That's why we have congestion. Right. So we want to I agree with you on that. Sir. Talking about existing, getting rid of existing congestion, I want to throw this out, and it, it lies with partially what we've been saying. Mm -hmm. Highway 17, unfortunately, we have too many cars, and we want to take rid of cars mm -hmm. so that we can uh, use the road to travel. And, it, and unfortunately, that's, that's the, the conundrum that we have, the problem, the juggernaut. And that's to take rid of a number of cars yet to travel. How are you going to do that except get rid of some cars yet travel? You're going to travel by mass transit, but you're not. But mass transit is going to move because it's congested. So you have two lanes, one lane dedicated to carpooling mm -hmm. and mass transit. I think, I, I, I'm sorry, but I think that's the only solution that we have to traffic congestion. We cannot uh, drive through, like blue collars, you know, designating uh, workers. We're all stuck in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would uh, uh, suggest that commerce is really important with the exception on carpooling uh, for, to allow us commercial licensed vehicles. That's it, carpooling, mass transit. We had that before, in, uh, both of those proposals before the County Transportation Commission at different times. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they discussed it, but they turned it down. And these are planners uh, and appointees, you know, so it's government. Yeah, oh, I mean, one of these things, uh, you, you can talk about an economist and they say, again, we're not pricing it right, and so if we actually price for the impacts that it's having, then you just keep on increasing the price. Uh, and there's actually a place in the back east that has variable pricing, um, and even San Francisco has the variable pricing for parking, um, to really try to, to shift the behavior, and it, and it shows back east, there's a toll road, and the toll ends up going to like 40 bucks to, to to go across that place because it really reflects that's how high you have to get it to get people to know, change their behavior. Um, not if you make it so that there's another alternative and you invest that money in something else. Yeah, but it takes a lot of political wealth. I'm not saying it's easy. Look, I'm going to try to say yeah. it's still inequitable because the, because the guy that's got the bucks is going to pay the money and you're going to, and you're slumping it off to other people who take mass transit. This plan is equitable. Everybody. Uh, plays the game equitably, meaning if carpooling, mass transit. I there's a lot of, you know, plan. there's a lot of, and this is where I would, again, encourage you to, um, to look at Joe Courtwright's work at City Observatory, because one of the things he does is he actually looks at, you know, we, in some ways we have congestion pricing already, especially for those places where if you're driving to park and parking is incredibly expensive, then low-income people are not driving. They're not. They're not driving to get there because they're not. They can't pay for the parking at the end of the ride. And so the system we have right now is incredibly inequitable because we're making them pay. We're making them drive farther away, making it more difficult for them to spend time with their family. They're more likely to get accidents because they're putting more, you know, uh, vehicle time on the roads. Like it's it's such an inequitable system right now that actually if we priced so that we could.